thank you very, very much indeed, Mark. Now I've got the very difficult job of having to live up to my own words, <laughs> which is, I don't think I'm going to be anywhere near as articulate as that, I'm afraid, this afternoon. Um, but now I sincerely thank you to Mark and, and to the whole of the um, SAFs committee here for inviting me. I've had an absolutely wonderful few days and it's been a real pleasure to get to know and, and speak to so many of you here. Uh, I also promise that I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I'm just having this as a bit of a prop so I can uh, see notes. <laughs> I have been uh, asked to make sure I speak loudly though and I've got my eye on a few people who are going to wave if my voice uh, drops. So I'm not singing but talking loudly. I'm going to try really hard not to repeat because a lot's been said already over the course of the past couple of days. And, you know, I think we all now are, are full of the, the examples about how academic freedom is being uh, threatened today. And I guess rather than repeating that, I'd like to try and expand and, and develop upon it a little bit more and, and really try and tease out um, how I think we've got to where we are today uh, and what we need to do to, to really try and change the current situation. I'd also like to try and just pick up on some of the things that I think have been really key points that have emerged already this morning. Um, so I really, the idea of a spectrum of woke, which Ava was talking about, uh, really struck with me because I, I think that's true. I, I think within all our institutions across many different countries in the Western world, you know, it, it, there's not a uniform um, approach being adopted. Not all the institutions are as equal captured, I wouldn't, I don't think. Um, but I think what's very interesting to my mind is to ask which institutions are the most captured. And to me, it seems certainly from a UK perspective, that it's the most elite academic institutions that are the most woke institutions. So in, in the UK, I would say that it's Oxford and Cambridge. It's, it's, you might have heard it's the Russell Group is the equivalent that we have of the Ivy League. You know, these are the universities which are really at the forefront of pushing this agenda. And to my mind, that speaks very much to the points that Francis was making um, about woke being a very elite project. You know, it, this is, is a, an upper middle class kind of capitalist. This is the, the form that elite ideology is taking today. And, and I think that's an important point to make. And I think with some of the, I guess, I don't know what word you'd use. You probably have a phrase, and forgive me, in, in Canada. In the UK, we talk about more kind of local, regional universities. In the US, people refer to community colleges. And I think they remain slightly, you know, and I'm, I'm hesitant, but slightly more grounded. And I do wonder if one of the reasons for that is because the pool of students that they're recruiting um, being perhaps more likely to remain living at home, more grounded within their families, within their local community. Perhaps the students are staying um, working in part-time jobs that they may have had for a number of years means that they're not quite as, as willing to go down the, the kind of track as in wholesale selling out. And whether that gives us some grounds for optimism or not, I don't know. But I think the concerning thing is the extent to which the elite universities have been captured. And I think it illustrates the extent to which woke values kind of acts as a, a filtering mechanism nowadays that demonstrating these you, you possess these values becomes almost a, a recruitment tool, you know, to, to allow people entry to universities in the first place and then being committed to demonstrating that you've taken on board those values is what gets you credentialized and enables you to leave with the piece of paper that opens up opportunities in the job market. Um, but what I want to try and explore really this afternoon is how I think threats to academic freedom have arisen in conjunction with this changing purpose of a university. Um, you know, again, just to, just to reiterate, I really agree with the point Francis was making about how it's the culture that we need to change. Uh, and I think this is both a sad thing, you know, and a negative thing and also a positive thing. It's, it's hard, I think, for us to confront this because clearly it's a much bigger task 
than just saying we need the correct two or three policy documents. You know, and if we can just, I'm not suggesting anybody here is that crude, but sometimes from debates outside, you, you get the impression that people think, you know, if we can only get the correct two or three policy documents in place, then that will be key to unlocking all of this and bringing about change. Well, if only, you know, I, I kind of, I wish it was that simple. I, I really don't think it is. I think the task we have ahead of us is much, much bigger than that. But it's also much more exciting in many ways. You know, this is about revitalizing the intellectual purpose of, of not just even the university, but I think actually of society. It's the most important task we have. It's vital to the future of humanity. And I think for, for individuals, it's vital to what actually makes us human. Um, one of the things I've been really pleased has not taken place this weekend, and, and one thing that makes me nervous a little bit about coming to conferences like this, and happens so often when I've been in conferences as similar to this in the UK and in the US, is people spend hours and hours wrangling over definitions of academic freedom and whether academic freedom, you know, does it mean this technical thing or is it free speech? And I've lost count of the number of times I've been criticized for um, just kind of eliding academic freedom and free speech. Uh, and people say, you know, it's not very academic and I'm not being very proper because I'm saying academic freedom and what I really mean is free speech. And, you know, I'm put my hand up, absolutely guilty as charged because I think the more we try and narrow down definitions of academic freedom, the more we chip away at it. You know, I think if, we, if academic freedom is to mean anything, it has to be a very broad, a very expansive definition that incorporates all the rights to free speech that you would expect to have in society, plus the additional employment protections um, that academics need, because uh, we do need, we should have that right to be offensive. That should be crucial to the project of being an academic, not to insult willy-nilly, although there may be times when you have to do that, um, but to push back and challenge the consensus. To me, that should be the most fundamental thing in the job description of what it means to be an academic. If you are not offending people, then I don't think you're doing a good job as an academic. I think this should be central to what it means to pursue knowledge, to challenge knowledge, to push back against a consensus without the right to offend, without offending. You're not doing any of those things. You, you, are, you don't deserve the label academic. Um, but I also think holding on to these broad definitions is important because it recognizes the way that the threats to academic freedom today are also very blurred. Um, you know, who would have guessed a hundred years ago that, that academics would be punished for writing things on social media? You know, you couldn't countenance that a hundred years ago. It's only with technological changes and, and the way that we changing ways we interact with each other in society, that these new threats to academic freedom have emerged. I think the, the problem today for, for us in this room is that so many of our academic colleagues have lost sight of the sense of what academic freedom is for and why it's important. They don't even have the ambition of wanting to challenge the consensus. They are the gatekeepers of the consensus. They are the people who are ruling out uh, other people who are trying to offend and push the boundaries of knowledge. Um, so for all those reasons, I think it's important that we look at changing the culture around our understanding of knowledge, our understanding of what a university is for. Um, the, the advantage of doing this, though, as far as I'm concerned, and, and the kind of optimistic thing is that if you change a few policy documents, you literally do that. You change a few policy documents. If you change the culture, you actually embed change. You, you make it much more difficult. You win arguments in, along the way, to put it simply. You, you convince people, you have to convince people of why you were right. And that makes for a much more um, long-standing victory. It makes for a much deeper victory uh, is what comes with success. And I think I can prove this point, uh, or this, this point becomes evident when we see 
how nowadays, you know, it, it's shallow. I wish it was much, much deeper. But there is still, I think, a rhetorical attachment that, that most scholars, most universities feel the need to have to academic freedom. You know, you, I, I'm not trying to pretend or to fool you or to fool myself that this is worth much. I mean, clearly it's not. But, but the very fact that it's often there on paper somewhere, you know, in some mission statement, page nine, bullet point seven, or, or the very fact that few academics, despite all their campaigns for that, that they may be involved with censoring, no platforming, you know, they often feel the need to even premise their censorship by saying, I believe in academic freedom. The problem is they don't stop there. They say, I believe in academic freedom, but, and as soon as you hear that, but, you know that they don't believe in academic freedom at all. They're lying, they're, they're fooling themselves. You know, you have this, this kind of, I believe in free speech, but some people's voices are too dominant and we just have to kind of silence the dominant voices so that the oppressed people can speak out. I believe in academic freedom, but some arguments are, have already been heard and we don't need to hear them again. Uh, I believe in academic freedom, but that doesn't give people the right to be offensive. And you know, whenever you hear those things, that you're in the presence of someone who doesn't believe in academic freedom at all. But the fact that they need to play that rhetorical game, you know, the fact that they need to kind of dress their words up in this statement by, by saying this at the beginning, suggests that when those arguments for academic freedom were first won, you know, I'm going back 100 years now, they were won so convincingly, you know, academic freedom at one point in the dim and distant past Past, you know, was clearly seen as being something that really was important, really was a fundamental principle to the university. And that argument was won so much um, that even now, even when it's long gone from practice, there's a rhetorical need to cling on to it. And obviously what we've got to do is, is kind of keep the rhetorical need, yes, recognise that it's rubbish, it means nothing, and, and reinvigorate what it was that prompted that initial sense of academic freedom being important. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's most shameless about the kind of butter people, you, you know, all these people, I believe in academic freedom, but is, is that, you know, and often this is so shameless and so transparent, what they really mean is that they want their free speech to be protected. And what they're really saying, you know, scratch the surface is, I believe in my academic freedom. I just don't believe in your academic freedom. I believe in my right to express my opinions, or I believe in other people's rights to say things that I agree with. I just don't want to have to hear anything or be forced to listen to anything that I don't agree with. And again, you know, that's not free speech, is it? You can't just have free speech for views that you agree with. Um, there's no argument to be had there if you're only defending what you've already decided in advance you agree with. You know, I, this is exactly, as was highlighted by Andrew uh, yesterday evening, this is exactly what the London Library was doing. You know, they, they clearly believe in free speech for the drag queens, for the uh, terrorists. You know, it's just my free speech that they are not prepared to put up with, which is, again, you know, just to reiterate, is not a belief in free speech at all. Um, it, it's censorship, it's hiding censorship behind the rhetoric of academic freedom, and it's hiding censorship behind discussions about power relations is, is what's really being said in many of these arguments. Uh, it's power that people are talking about. And this, this focus on power and the linking of power to, to speech rights or really speech privileges is built on this assumption that, that a very crude identity politics based assumptions that white people have dominated discourse for centuries. So white people must give way to people of color. Men must give way to women. Cis people must give way to trans people in these kind of complex intersectional hierarchies that they're creating of pyramids of power and then allocating, you know, who's the least powerful, who must then be compensated for by being given the most speech rights, who's the most powerful, who must be knocked down, have, power, have, have, have speech rights taken away from them. So it's a, a complicated game that they're playing, but it's a fundamentally wrong game 
as well. I mean, even to attempt it is wrong. It's wrong. It's clearly not respecting free speech, not respecting academic freedom. But the assumptions that, that lie behind it are fundamentally wrong as well. They're wrong about where power lies in society today. They ignore the role that social class plays. You know, that, that does not feature in these identity politics pyramids whatsoever. Again, you know, you might occasionally get the odd rhetorical nod, oh yes, and class, but, but they're not interested. You know, the, the people constructing these hierarchies could not give a damn about social class. Um, the other thing they, they fail to account for, which I think is really important nowadays, and again, I think it was Francis, I referred to it about victim culture, you know, the, the kind of the weaponization of victimhood that has taken place over the course of, re of recent decades and the way that victimhood or, or claims to victimhood, I should say, actually makes people very powerful nowadays. I don't know if you use this phrase in Canada, in the UK, an expression that I really like, um, and I think it rings so true, is the cry bully. You know, the, these activists who are, are very quick to cry, but actually their tears um, belie their bullying tactics. And these, these people who claim victimhood are very much aware of the power that this status gives them. And I think one way to kind of illustrate this point is to look at a phenomenon, a sociological phenomenon, you could call it, I'm really interested in, this idea of identity fraud, you know, people pretending to be someone they're not. And in the past, I think it was very interesting that if people were going to conduct identity fraud, they would pretend to be a member of a more privileged group. So you would have people kind of, I mean, Mad Men was a program I really loved. You know, you look at Don Draper, the kind of pretending to be the war hero or, you know, pretending to be somebody who's survived, you know, you're taking on this status, which you don't deserve. I mean, in the UK, I'm sure I've spoken to so many people who've had parents or grandparents from the UK and might be familiar with the idea that working class children go back to the 19. 40s, 1950s, were given elocution lessons to, to kind of get the regional accents beaten out of them so they could sound as if they were more plummy and more upper class. And again, you know, identity fraud's perhaps going a bit too far in that context, but the idea was you were trying to adopt a higher sto social status to the one that you were born into you know, go back far enough on women who wanted to be pilots, you know, I'm not saying for one second they were transgender, but they would wear trousers, you know, they would be happy to pass themselves off as men, they knew they weren't men, but they would be happy to pass themselves off as men if it meant that this would open more career opportunities for them. I mean, black people were being so bleaching creams to lighten their skin, you can see this everywhere you look. But I think what's really interesting is how this has come absolutely full circle. And you see the very, very opposite when people look at, at, at adopting a different identity nowadays. I mean, most famously, obviously, is, is Rachel Dolezal, who I'm sure everybody's heard of, uh, the white woman who uh, darkened her skin and um, b became the kind of a black head of the local branch of the NAACP. Um, in the US, but, but it's a big thing um, in kind of trendy young girls, kind of the fake tan, the hoop earrings, the, the black hair. There's a, a word for it, you know, the, obviously cultural appropriation is what gets called out, but black fishing is also the accusation. But I think what's interesting again is the very fact that people are, are trying to, uh, to adopt these more oppressed identity groups. And people are not stupid. You know, people do this because this is seen as where it's an attractive identity nowadays. I mean, I, I'm sorry to break it to people in this room if I'm breaking it to anybody, but being an elderly white male nowadays is not the kind of attractive position, the powerful position that people want to be in. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So for all these, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> 
So for all these kind of complex intersectional hierarchies of oppression and privilege that are being created by academics nowadays, I think reality is far more complex um, than people would have us believe. But the, the, to come back to the main point, you know, the, the fact of doing these, of creating these um, hierarchies of privilege is, is the assumption then that speech rights can somehow be parceled out, divided up. You know, nobody has 100% but you, you know, you're a black transgender lesbian, so you can have 98%. You know, you're a white man, so you can have 2% speech rights. And the idea that we can kind of play these complex games and somehow create a level playing field of power and privilege and, and speech rights. The problem with this, and the reason why I'm, I'm kind of talking about this today, is that it, it fundamentally in, in terms of, of academia and, and why we have universities, I think, is because it should be a marketplace of ideas and it should be the place where intellectual content is judged on the basis of its merit, where it's judged according to truth claims, where it's judged uh, alongside you know, whether it can be contested or challenged and that contest and the challenge should take place on intellectual grounds, on intellectual tests and standards that we might, according to acad different academic disciplines, set for the knowledge um, that we're considering. And the whole discourse around identity and power takes away the, the workings of it. It messes with the workings of that marketplace of ideas. What we're being told is that the marketplace doesn't operate on the basis of intellectual merit, of which ideas are better than other ideas. We're being told we should judge ideas based on the skin color or the genitals of the person who's speaking about the ideas. And I think this creates huge problems for not just universities, but for society, because it means that we have messed up how we produce knowledge in the world today. We've messed up um, uh, what, what, how we pursue knowledge, how we contribute to, new, to, to existing knowledge, how we judge knowledge in the world. We're, not, we're no longer judging ideas uh, in their own merit. We're no longer seeing ideas as being colorblind. Um, we're, we're judging ideas on the basis of the identity of the originator. And that is just not a good way for, for society to advance. It's not a good way to decide what to teach children. Um, so we see at the most extreme examples you know, of, of, of Maori children in New Zealand, for example, being taught Maori maths. You know, to me, kind of two plus two plus two plus two equals four. You know, nothing gets more objective, more value neutral than that kind of statement. But if we've got to, uh, even that now is being kind of derided as this kind of product of white Western rational thought. You know, and you can have different maths. If you don't like that maths, have different maths. Uh, you know, the, the cultural vandalism that this does, it, I think is, is, is racist, is racist in the extreme because it's saying then that Shakespeare, Plato, Mozart, you know, th these are not as they were always seen up until two or three decades ago as being, you know, the, the most valuable intellectual legacy for the whole of humanity. In effect, what's being said is that this is the intellectual property of white people. Now, that's a, a horrible thing to say, you know, are we really, is that really what people want to say? That Shakespeare is inaccessible to black people? Um, that Shakespeare is, is the exclusive terrain for white people? You know, I, I just, that, I, it's, it's, I think is the most disgustingly racist statement you can come out with. But it, to come back to epistemology, you know, again, what's underlying this to take it to extremes is the sense that we've moved, as Mark was saying, from a kind of idea of truth with a capital T of truth that could be available for everybody to contest and challenge and hopefully not take for granted for all time, but to, to push back against uh, to this idea, you know, you take it to the absolute um, limit. And what we have is my truth 
you know, the, the forget even talking on behalf of identity groups, but my truth. And again, to see how far this idea has filtered down into popular culture, I have to look at um, my um, country's best gift to the United States, uh, Meghan and Harry, and I'm sure people <laughs> saw uh, in, in their interview that they did, it was probably about a year and a half ago now, with Oprah Winfrey, where they insisted on speaking their truth. Um, well, I mean, we've had another more recent example for that, anyone who's followed the news in the past couple of days, about their two-hour uh, near-deadly car chase. Sorry, I probably shouldn't laugh. But <laughs> their two-hour car chase chase through the streets of Manhattan and we've had various police officers coming out and saying actually do you know what this just isn't actually possible uh, for anyone who's ever been to Manhattan and knows the grid system and all the traffic lights you know the idea that you could have this two hour long pursuit at high speed 80 miles an hour through the streets of Manhattan for two hours you know this is just not possible but you can't say that because it was Megan's truth that this did happen you know and, and who were we to to kind of talk about annoying things like traffic lights and speed limits and roads. Anyway, the point I want to make is that when knowledge comes, becomes subjective uh, and when it becomes based upon the speaker's um, lived experience, it's uncontestable. Like I said, I can't say to Megan, I wish I could, but I can't say to Megan, you're talking rubbish, you know, because she's not. She's, she's talking her truth. Um, uh, the point is that there's more than one way to kill academic freedom dead. And by adding but to their sentences, this supposed defense of academic freedom, these people who are trying to tell us that they support academic freedom, really show us that they don't support academic freedom at all. Um, and this creates a huge problem for those of us who do uh, care about academic freedom and do think it's important, not just as a nice to have, not just because it enables us to say what we think, although that's vitally important, but because it enables us to play a role in, in pursuing knowledge. It enables us to fulfill our academic um, function. Um, you know, in, in recent years, there's been quite a lot of light shone upon the political leanings of professors. I know Heterodox Academy in the US, a Policy Exchange in the UK, have done surveys um, looking at the political leaning of, of academics in universities and what they've shown. I'm sure you're all, all familiar with these studies is that you've not just got more left-wing academics nowadays, but, but the faculty as a whole are becoming not just left-wing, but more homogenous in their outlook, more homogenous uh, in their views. And what's important, I think, is that it's, it's less representative of society as a whole. And, and clearly, there's a lot of, of concern about this. I, th I think it is something that we should, should keep an eye on. But the point is, if universities were operating as a marketplace of ideas, this wouldn't actually matter at all, because we would still be um, judging ideas based upon their merit, not upon the political leanings of the people who are putting the ideas out there. You know, one thing I would hate to see is, is a kind of McCarthy era style political test uh, to take place at the job interview stage, you know, having a quota, we've already got eight left-wing academics, so we, we must have kind of six right-wing academics to even things up a little bit. And then you start asking people about their political leanings in a job interview. But you, you shouldn't have to do that. That shouldn't be necessary if a marketplace of ideas was actually operating successfully. The best ideas would win out. Um, but the problem we've got today is that too many academics don't see their role as contributing to the sum of human knowledge at all. They have no belief in a marketplace of ideas. If your views are based on identity and power, you think an, a marketplace of ideas is skewed. You think it's a bogus concept. You don't even want this to become a meaningful thing. And, and worse even than that, they see too many academics, I think, see scholarship 
as an advocacy project nowadays, scholarship and activism have, have become confused. So it's not the case that, you know, who cares what, what cross people put on a ballot paper, you know, when elections are held every four or five years, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. What happens, what, what becomes a problem is when that, those political leanings not only come into your academic work, but actually become the purpose of your academic work when research is confused with advocacy. And, and you know, in this context, what, what happens is rather than research being open-ended, rather than people being open to changing their mind as they go along, the temptation is to start with the conclusions. You start with the point you want to prove, and then you track back. You think, this is what this is where I'm aiming to get to. What do I need to do? What research must I do in order to prove the point I want to make? And certainly in the social sciences, it seems that so much academic research nowadays is following that model. And again, it means there's no, there's no argument to be had out. There's no marketplace of ideas. The conclusions, the goal of the research is determined. So there's no need for academic freedom academic freedom, you know, would call into question these conclusions. You don't want that. And the political homogeneity on campus then means that most academics are not meeting much challenge to the ideas that they're putting forward. Um, you know, at very, very best then in the hands of these butter people, you know, these people, academic freedom, but is that academic freedom becomes just one value among many. And this was something Patrick was, was talking about this morning, you know, whether academic freedom should really be a superior value, which, which I absolutely think it must. You know, we can't say what's nice to have in a university is diversity a university is you know equity inclusion diversity and academic freedom as soon as we kind of run those values along in a line like that again we kill academic freedom dead because you're saying that these things are, are equally valid are equally important and are therefore competing with one another and as soon as you set up a contest between inclusion and academic freedom Academic freedom will lose out because you're, you're saying really that, that the inclus inclusion is the preeminent value. You know, you, you cannot have them both together. Um, you know, again, it, it fundamentally misses the point of academic freedom, not, not just as a, again, not just as a social value, but as a value crucial to scholarship, crucial to the mission, the purpose of a university. And it's that that we've lost and it's that that needs to be um, reinvigorated today. So, you know, I'm conscious of time now, I want to, to look back at uh, kind of how we've got here then. If you go back a century, I think one of one of the best documents I think ever ever written on academic freedom um, was the American Association of University Pre Professors, their Declaration of the Principles of Academic Freedom, um, written in 1915. They, they various updated versions, but I think for the best one, you have to go back to the original. You have to go back to 1915, and it gives voice. I'm sure people are familiar with it, but just to reiterate, there are three core demands there. Uh, that authority within the university should lie with scholars rather than with administrators. That professional autonomy in teaching and research is essential for maintaining academic standards. And that professors should have freedom for extramural utterance. In other words, shouldn't be restricted just to their disciplinary specialisms. Now, these demands um, arose you know, back in this context of 1915 out of a situation where high profile professors were either pushed into resigning or being sacked because they were espousing views that offended the institution's um, financial benefactors. So there was a, the, the kind of the views of the benefactors often tied up with, with religion and, and Christianity or even um, you know, where their business interests lay. So one professor resigned because he got into trouble uh, for supporting striking railway workers. It turned out the university benefactor had a stake in the local railway branch, you know, supported them, didn't want to back the strikers, sacked or pushed to resign lecturers who took an opposing view. 
you know, the parallels with today then when you just stop and think about it for a couple of seconds are just immediately obvious. You've got high profile academics either resigning or, or being pushed out of universities because their views have caused offence. It might not be um, high profile institutional financial backers, but it's the managers or even worse, it's often the students and the students as fee payers, the students with the financial leverage upset the students and, and you find yourself in trouble very quickly nowadays. Um, so the real people, the people with power in universities nowadays are, are often not the academics at all, but this burgeoning kind of managerial administrative class uh, that's expanded from personnel to human resources to EDI officers. Uh, you've been talked about quite a lot over the course of these past couple of days, but I think what's increasingly obvious to me is the the fact that these people now have authority, um, not just to control academics' jobs, but to increasingly to dictate what gets taught. Uh, so I know speaking to some people yesterday evening, but this is a big thing in Canada, but it's massive in the UK as well right now. And this is the decolonize the curriculum movement. Um, this idea that you need to rid your reading list, again, if you're, whether it's English literature or philosophy, you know, boot out the white men, um, bring in you know, uh, anything that's basically not been written by a white man, uh, as if knowledge is, again, and to come back to what I was saying at the beginning, that knowledge is tainted by the identity of the originator, that, that students nowadays will only be able to relate to um, things that are written by people who share the same biology as them. Um, a, a crucial difference is obviously this is now being enacted and enforced by academic colleagues, unlike 100 years ago, where these limits and demands were coming from outside of the university by financial benefactors. But I think the, th the, the three demands that were, ma were made at that time, the, the importance of autonomy and power to decide what to teach, what to research, what to say outside of the university, lying with academics and lying with scholars, I think is just as important today as it was when people were arguing to teach evolution a uh, hundred years ago. I think what's really important and why that AAUP declaration has stood for over 100 years is because it was being determined and worked out at a point when uh, universities were at a really crucial turning point. You know, they were trying to, the discussion was about what is a university for? You know, is it an elite finishing school? Is it a, a kind of equivalent of a seminary or a madrasa? You know, is it somewhere where students are going to imbibe kind of existing knowledge knowledge and values to get the certificate, to earn them the credentials to take a job in empire, as it would have been, or, you know, to enter a kind of senior level of the church or the professions. And the sad thing is, you can see universities are just becoming exactly like that again. I mean, it, again, it's not maybe not religion that, that's setting the course nowadays, but the new religion of woke that's meaning students are coming to imbibe, to get certificates, to be credentialed. Um, you know, and, and it's this battle for the heart of the university. What's the university for? What, can it be more than just being a woke finishing school? What does the university mean in terms of knowledge, in terms of truth, that I think is, is just as important that we have out nowadays? And I would really see the kind of the collapse of academic freedom as being absolutely linked to this collapse of knowledge. Um, I'm conscious I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just jump very quickly about a little bit. One of the things I want to talk about very quickly, again, is, is just kind of where this has come from, you know, how, how can we trace, how far back do we have to go to look to see where these threats have emerged from? And, and I'd put it back very, very far indeed. I mean, the things that we've talked about already, kind of postmodernism, identity politics, victim culture, I've talked about them. I think these things are all fundamentally and very, very important in shaping the threats that we're experiencing to universities nowadays. And a lot of these things have their roots in the late 1960s. However, I'd go back, I'd go back a generation earlier. I'd go back 20 years earlier than that. I think by talking about postmodernism, victim culture, identity politics, et cetera, all vitally important, you know, absolutely spot on. I think that these things have had such a corrosive impact 
but by talking about them in isolation, we run the risk, I think, of making it seem as if postmodernism has somehow won out on the intellectual merits of its arguments, that it was somehow victorious because it was, it was postmodern thinking or critical theory that vanquished everything that went before. I actually think that's a bit wrong. And I think, you know, you, we need to look back at this post-Second World War generation, an immediate post-Second World War, uh, what was happening in universities at that point. And I think before postmodernism came along, there was a complete lack of confidence, lack of faith in existing knowledge in, in the academic mission at that point in time, a questioning, a fundamental questioning and lack of faith in enlightenment values, in truth, in beauty, in reason, in rationality. You can understand why. It's apparent to see how the horrors of war, you know, what, what became apparent that people were capable of doing could lead to this fundamental reassessment of, of what the Enlightenment was thought to have led to, of what had been unleashed. You know, you can see how people would then be led to question this, but this broader attack then upon Western civilization, surrender, if you like, the holding up of a white flag, the defeat of, of cultural uh, ca uh, capital at, at that point in time meant that by the time postmodernism came along in the 1960s, the door was not just kind of left ajar, ajar, you know, universities were wide open in terms of looking for a purpose. And to kind of reiterate that, you know, I think what's really interesting is that this 1915 declaration, um, that uh, 1915 declaration of, of principles of academic freedom, and that was rewritten in 1940, you know, even before the horrors of the Second World War, uh, we were, were fully aware of, of what that had entailed. These were rewritten, it became watered down, it became a statement a principle, not, not the kind of proud declaration. It became a statement and it became linked to uh, a concept of, of the common good. You know, I'd, I'd take that today. You know, believe me, I would take that today. This idea that we have a statement of academic freedom and the higher education knowledge is linked to the common good. Actually, you know, like I say, I would take that, but I do still think it represented a significant step backwards on what had taken place because by saying you're linking the pursuit of knowledge to the common good, you're linking it outside of knowledge itself. You're not saying knowledge is a goal in and of itself. It's of intrinsic importance. You're giving it this goal which is external to the university and is then subject to being defined and redefined by different generations. You know, what happens if in 2023, 20, now, <laughs> we say that the common good is woke? You know, and we're committed to having universities geared around this external goal and the external goal becomes the pursuit of woke values. You kind of become hoist by your own petard. But the, the point is, even in, in 1940, the idea that, that universities had an intrinsic sense of purpose, that knowledge was worthwhile pursuing in its own terms, was already being called into question. And I think... Um, you know, this idea of, of external goals being imposed upon academia, that, that's really where we've, we've come from. And what we really need to re restate nowadays to push back against this age of woke is to kind of re-enchant um, knowledge as being something which is important for its own sake once more. Um, you know, we need to move beyond external goals, we need to move beyond the instrumental, and we need to try and, and re-enchant a, a sense of education, of, of a, a better for humanity, better for people to be educated than not to be educated. I'm sure I didn't think of that. I'm sure somebody else has said that before me. Um, but this idea that it's just better, better for people to know than better for people to not know. And knowing means thinking, means thinking critically, means questioning, means we need academic freedom, um, not that we, uh, indoctrination implies none of those things. Indoctrination implies not thinking critically, not questioning, not uh, engaging our rational minds. It, it, we don't need academic freedom when the goal of the university is indoctrination. So, so just to just 
to finish, I think that's the, just the key point that I want to make. We've lost academic freedom because universities have given up on the goal of education. They've given up on the pursuit of knowledge. When universities are about indoctrination into a set of woke values, when it's about getting people to imbibe dogma, academic freedom is fundamentally useless. It's counterproductive. You know, it gets in the way of the mission. So in order for academic freedom to be important again, we need to re-enchant that mission of education being important, of knowledge being important. That, that's the value that, that then makes academic freedom crucial to the mission of a university. So I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Boris and Christina, and then I'll collect some more names. Boris. Amazing. Really, really good. Um, you actually sounded to me as though, well, I'm thinking first of all, Heather McDonald, oh. of the diversity delusion, you know, how the universities have lost their sense of the mission of preserving the heritage of great works of art, literature, philosophy, etc., etc. But Alan Bloom, Closing of the American Mind, um, he, it seems to me, presents a vision of the university that ties it to the Socratic understanding of knowledge as something intrinsically choice-worthy. And he also then talks about what happened in modernity, how with Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, and others, what you had was a rejection of that idea and what Leo Strauss called the politicization of philosophy, which is to say the subordination of the pursuit of knowledge to practical, pragmatic concerns. Why? Because this whole Socratic idea of knowledge as intrinsically choice-worthy has proven to be bunk. We could go into the arguments about that, but that was the basic thing. And so Bloom is now wrestling with that whole issue. He's saying, because of that modern turn, the universities have lost their original Socratic sense of their mission as a place for liberal education, pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, by testing one's opinions against the greatest works of the past, and it's the need for academic freedom. You lose that, you lose everything. And here you are, you're just articulating that, that basic conundrum so, so beautifully. Um, that's great, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, see that, did I see Cassie? Uh, okay. Uh, fascinating talk. I just want to give you a little bit of uh, advice how you can use something that the woke experts on free academic freedom. One of their newest things was, it's kind of the flip side what you said at the beginning. You said essentially academic freedom is free speech plus. What they are saying is free speech is for everybody. Every dummy can have free speech. Academic freedom is something that only academics have. There's an expectation of quality. Yeah, yeah, quality, you know. Obviously their quality is maybe a little bit different from what you and I think of quality. But nevertheless, they are on record of having said that. So there is an expectation of quality. Only people who have gone through the ac academy have gotten their doctorate are actually capable of speaking knowledgeably about issues. And then they try to, like, you probably are familiar with uh, when the Rebecca Tuval uh, story broke, that essentially she was accused that she was not citing the literature. The literature obviously being by the book people, so she hadn't read all of it, apparently. Um, but the idea really was then, if you can only speak about philosophy if you have a degree in philosophy, you can only talk about physics if you have a degree in physics and that kind of stuff. 
And I think it's really, really important to throw that stuff right back at them, especially the quality thing, because I fully agree with you, yes. Merit and quality and merit, it's not really that different. So beating them at their own game, I think, is one, one thing that we all ought to do a lot more and to get ahead of the game. No, definitely. Thank you. Um, just just quick comment on that. I mean, uh, the elitism of academics cannot be understated. And that I feel bad about saying that because I do actually think that academic work should be an elite project, but not socially elite. It should be intellectually elite and, and it should be an intellectual elitism, which is accessible to anybody on the basis of merit, you know. Um, I've mentioned to a few people in informal conversations since I've been here about how fundamental I thought um, Brexit was to the political landscape in the UK and all the debates that took place around that. And, um, you know, that was obviously 2016 when the referendum took place. I was still working at the University of Kent at the time. I was kind of publicly outed as a, as a leaver. I, I realistically, you know, I, I outed myself as, as a leave voter, which put me in the majority in the UK. Obviously, we know that UK left uh, the EU or tried to leave the EU. Um, but it put me in a very, very, very small minority on campus campus and to explain, to kind of try and describe what the situation was like in universities in the UK at that time was, you know, it's really difficult to put into words. Uh, the best example I can give is a, research, a colleague I was working with, not in my department, but in another department on, at my university, had been working very, very closely with him on a, a joint research project wouldn't even make eye contact with me on campus, you know, would walk past me and deliberately, you know, fake not seeing me. That that was the kind of mood. And you had academics, serious grown-up academics, kind of crying um, in the corridors the day after the result was announced, crying in the cafes. The university just became this big kind of emotional support group for distraught academics. But what underpinned all of that, and the reason why I'm kind of saying this in relation to what you're saying was this it unleashed this complete unashamed elitism where the problem became not that academics were so out of touch with majority opinion that the reason for the tears was was not just upset at the result but shock you know and, and a number of colleagues said to me I, I don't know anyone. How could this happen? I don't know anyone who voted to leave. And they'd say this almost as a badge of honour. And I'd think to myself, well, you should be so ashamed to say that. You're essentially saying you live in a complete bubble and you don't speak to kind of people outside of academia and outside of the university. So the tears were driven by shock. But then there was this sense of anger. You know, the problem is we've let these people have a say. You know, we've let the ordinary people have a stay in democracy if it had only been left to us you know the academics the people with the phds and the certificates and the letters after our name the right decision would have been made and, and britain would still be in the eu and that was the lesson that came from it but what was really interesting following that uh, certainly my impression and i then left the university um a year afterwards because i you know various reasons couldn't bear it anymore um there was a, a very obvious doubling down at that point on all the EDI missions. And, and it was really articulated quite clearly that if this is what we're having to put up with outside the university with these kind of ignorant um, masses, you know, we've got to make the most of our position to change society from inside the university and the kind of the indoctrination mission, the politicization of what was going on inside academia became much, much more overt. Um, views that, you, you know, practices that you knew people believed in or were, were kind of taking place under the surface, suddenly it became very socially acceptable to, to talk about all of this out loud. If you were voting at both days, <laughs> if they'd given them voting at both days, that's what say. Susan and then Francis. Uh, I won't come here today and uh, hearing all of these wonderful things. I'd like to pass something on to you. I would like to give you a weapon to use against the woke. 
Uh, because one of their big cudgels that they use to beat you and everyone else with is the idea of pain, which is why we have trigger warnings and we have cancellations because we know words are violence and violence causes people pain. And pain can cause trauma, which can cause PTSD. So a teacher who refuses to use trigger warnings is going to be in big trouble. Now, it happens that I have stumbled upon a book written by a wonderful man, uh, PhD, by the name of George Bonanno. It's sort of like banana, but with four O's. Written a book called The End of Trauma. And it's a very serious guy because he studied trauma and PTSD. That's been his career. Now, the interesting thing is that somewhere in the course of the 20th century, the idea got loose that you could suffer long-term damage from some kind of terrible thing happening in your life. And indeed, that is true. There are people who really do have PTSD and they need help and treatment for it. But the idea got loose that somehow or other any adverse conditions in your life could cause you permanent damage. Now, I'm going to try a little mental test that you can give yourself right now. And that is, out of 100 people who suffer a really, really bad event, how many, what percentage of them we'll call it, would have serious repercussions? And let's get away from the trigger warnings and get right down to things like going to war. How about big terrorist event in which you're trapped in the middle? And give yourself just one moment to think of it. What percentage of people do you think might be damaged by that? I'm not going to ask you any and to answer the question because when I started reading the book, I would have guessed somewhat above 50 percent, perhaps. And what the this gentleman discovered was that it's somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. That in fact, 70 to 80 percent of people will walk will walk away from a war or the Twin Towers and be fine. They might have a month or so of a little bit of upset, but they'll go on with their lives. In fact, one of the ironies of the Twin Towers, I'm going to tell this because it's so funny, is that they allotted millions of dollars and recruited thousands of, of therapists to deal with the people who were going to have all the fallout. Crickets, they wouldn't, they, the therapists had no one to talk to and when some of them tried to go out and recruit, uh, candidates, they were told, get out of my life, I don't want to talk to you. So I showed you how useless it was. Now, the useful part of this book is that the man was studying it for a reason. He wanted to know how could you help people get through trauma without damage. And he came up with some very simple exercises that people can do, whether they have just suffered a trauma or whether they might suffer trauma some part of their life. Now, in this group of people that I'm talking about right here and now, you people who are a part of universities, if you got the book, if you read the book and maybe got it into the hands of the student services, they might be able to run some little classes on how to become better prepared for trauma. And the next time somebody arrives at your door complaining that they're going to get triggered in your class, you might offer them, here, there's a class you can go to that will help you with this. And maybe the most important thing of all is if you know of any young people in your life who have absorbed this kind of philosophy, maybe you might even buy them a book. But seriously, dangerous ideas have gotten loose in the world. And one of them is that human beings are so fragile that they're going to fall apart because of words, never mind the twin towers collapsing down on your head, but that words alone could cause a university student irreparable harm. And what is the question? Well, I, I, I will respond to that. I, I agree, and I think what universities are doing is they're priming students to experience trauma about events that wouldn't be traumatic. And just a very, very quick, um, funny story that's in the British newspaper today. It's exam season at Oxford University, again, the most elite university in the UK. And traditionally, God knows where this has come from or why, um, the, some group brings alpacas or llamas um, in the guise of a well-being initiative. So the students who are stressed can leave the library for an hour and go and pet, 
pet the llamas to kind of make them feel better. What's funny, and the reason why this is in the newspaper, even though it's been going on for years, is a number of students have complained to the university about how distracting it is. They just want to concentrate on revising. And they've got this parade of llamas going across the library with a huge queue of students standing up to pet them. And they just want to revise. I really, really, really enjoyed your reference to Harry and Megan. So, would you think that the idea of her truth or his truth um, does it stem from the fear of controversy? And how did this fear of controversy kind of creep into? academia, society, life in general, because as, was, as it seems to be become a theme here, we are self-censoring ourselves to a certain extent because we fear of crisis. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's absolutely... Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct, that, that we are self-censoring and, and people do feel reprisals and, and that's not unreasonable. But I'm not convinced that's where the my truth comes from. I think it conveniently serves that purpose and it, it serves the purpose of allowing people to deflect from criticism and question, you know, whatever I say, you can't question me or challenge me on it because it's just my truth. But I'm not sure that's the origins. I would locate it much more with narcissism. Um, you know, it's a belief that I'm at the center of my universe. I don't think they think, I don't think their minds work as there's objective truth and reality, but I will say this to avoid having to be questioned. I don't think they see the objective reality at all. I think they only see the world through their own lens and, and only see their truth as being the only kind of truth. And I think it very much comes from the identity politics. Uh, you know, if you're told that, that um, knowledge is linked intrinsically to, pers uh, knowledge is perspectival, knowledge is a question of perspective, uh, that standpoint theory, um, your particular standpoint based on your identity is where knowledge comes from, then the logical conclusion to draw from that is that truth is perspectival, truth is about your perspectives, your understanding, your interpretation of the world, and it taps into a, a narcissism that I think is a kind of bigger psychological issue in society as well. Uh, Francis, and uh, then Bill, and then Peter, but I might not have seen someone at the back. Is there someone at the back who I've had a hand up? Okay, uh, Francis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Just, uh, I have a co one comment and a question. The comment is, for those of you who think that trigger warnings will save you, there was a person fired in the United States for giving a trigger warning before showing the Mohammed cartoons, and they said she should be fired because of the trigger warning, because she knew ahead of time that it would cause problems for our students. So don't rely on that one. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, I was curious about your views about wokeism and capitalism. And do you think there it's connected to capitalism? And if so, how is it connected to capitalism? Yeah, good point. Uh, first of all, just on trigger warnings. I mean, in the UK, uh, university lecturers are actually told not to use trigger warnings now, uh, not because they think students shouldn't have contents, but that the word trigger might trigger people who have been <laughs> victims of gun violence. So you have to call them content warnings instead to be less triggering. Um, but on the woke thing, you know, I, I do, I, I completely think it, it's very much linked to the kind of high stages of capitalism, as you've articulated. Um, yourself and you know I, I think for me the way I would understand this is that I think it is a fundamentally anti-democratic um, project it, it's an elite project and and the you know I, I risk of getting into to a very kind of detailed discussion which is very quickly going to take me out of my depths intellectually I think the stage of capitalism if at that we're at at the moment, if you like, is, is very woke itself. You know, you can see the whole Dylan Mulvaney kind of controversies in the US, you know, the rainbow pride flags on 
every business. And you think if your values are being promoted by every high street bank, you know, the chances are they are probably not that radical. Um, they're probably not pushing back against the establishment consensus. They're probably coinciding with the establishment consensus. And I, I think that the kind of the form, economic form, people will know far more about this than me here. You know, we have a very state managed kind of capitalism at the moment. Um, I've been talking about the marketplace of ideas, but, but it seems even in an economic sense, kind of rampant free market marketism is not really the order of the day. Um, you know, in most sectors of the UK economy right now, we seem to have a, a kind of very odd mixture of what appears to be free market, but is, is very much kind of a state controlled, state managed free market. I don't mean in a, a, a kind of nationalized industries kind of sense, but I mean the way um, the capitalism is, is regulated in conjunction, is operating in conjunction with the state. And I see real kind of parallels there with the way um, kind of th this elite ideas can then become taken on board very rad very rapidly, uh, uh, very easily by a, a kind of elite section at the top of society. As I mentioned yesterday, gives them all kinds of advantages in being able to divide and rule, um, to use a kind of crude um, socialist understanding of, of kind of divide and rule in the workplace. You're, you're dividing people by skin color and you're um, kind of a, 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 enabling yourself to, to kind of have a, a virtue capital, if you like, that enables you to signal to other people that you are part of the elite group. So that's all very crude, but I'll, I'll think about that more. So, Bill and then Peter. Thanks for a terrific talk. I want to slightly disagree with what I perceive to be a, a slight romanticization of the liberal history of the academy. Uh, I think the last hundred years are also littered with the corpses of people who have been uh, victimized. There, and the reason I say this is there's a factor over and above all of the points that you wisely made. Uh, and that is that group dynamics, and in particular, the uh, punishing response to disagreement hasn't changed over the last uh, hundred years, or the last thousand years. If you invalidate my cherished worldview, I'm going to react. Uh, uh, there's a long tradition, actually, of research on the punishing experience of attitude dissimilarity. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, a very heavy invariant. And we have to make room for confronting that, possibly within the envelope of, uh, uh, of academic freedom. But just uh, you know, in my own field of sex research, it was in the 1930s, Magnus Hirschfeld's students burned his library in the Bibelplatz uh, in Berlin. Uh, Kinsey's research in the 40s uh, was saved only by the university president, so they went one after his funder and basically killed him in his research. Bruce Rin's meta-analysis, published in uh, an Impact Factor 50 journal, was condemned not only by his university, the American Psychological Association, and a unanimous vote of the U.S. Congress, and that was all before Phil Rushton came along. So the expression of dissonant heterodox ideas is intrinsically taken to be a punishing experience of disconfirming my cherished worldview, and we've got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to perhaps create a culture where that's understood to be uh, part of the test, retest, and confront process of the accumulation of knowledge. I couldn't agree more, you know, and, and I hope I didn't create the impression that there was ever a golden age of, of, of in academia, because unfortunately, I, w I wish there was, you know, I wish we could point to a period in time and, and say, you know, that was the golden age, that's what we want to hark back to. Uh, you know, and even when I was talking about the 1915 Declaration, you, you had to realise that was written in the context of kind of all these bad things happening, that's what it emerged out of. Um, so there was never a golden age. I think the point is that as the, the, the nature of the threats have changed over time and, and the response to the threats has then changed over time. And I, I guess I think what's particularly bad about the, the, this current moment and challenging for us in this current moment is that Whereas before, more of the threats were external, now they're more internal. But I also agree, you know, there's also been internal Our threats. Issue is, I don't like people invalidating my worldview. And now, now I've got a social mob that can help me enforce that. Peter. 
just wanted to remark that in doing some reading, I ran across someone, a psychologist, uh, saying that what is going on in the woke communities, such as in the microaggressions, is actually reverse cognitive behavior therapy to <laughs> sensitize people to assaults uh, instead of uh, trying to get over them. I might even be able to dig out this uh, reference for you, but it's something to consider. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is Jonathan Haidt's work, isn't it? And uh, no, this wasn't Jonathan Haidt. This was some other psychologist. I think he may have been writing about it. But uh, uh, no, I've come across this idea. It's Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt as well. Yeah, and, and I'm sure other people do. No, no, but I think it's an important point. But I'm always slightly wary about... Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I think there's important points to be made there, but I think we need to go beyond the psychological as well. I think the, the problems that we're confronting in universities, uh, you know, yes, we can look at the individual psychology of, of students, both, both on their own and, and en masse, but I think these are broader political and social problems as well, and, and the psychological approach will only help us so far. I'm going to ask a question before I call on Will. Uh, I think there may have been a golden age. Uh, Thales and Aximander and Aximides. According to Carl Popper's understanding, uh, Thales says uh, everything is made of water. And then he says to his, uh, his, his uh, student, Aximander, uh, yeah, Aximander um, this is my theory, my explanation. Uh, take it, um, criticize it, uh, come up with something better. And of course, Aximander, uh, probably the most brilliant person ever, but uh, you know, we know so little about it. Um, Anaximander said, uh, no, uh, the, everything is made of the unbounded. Whatever the core substance is, it can't be one of which we have sensory contact. It must be something below that. Uh, he also said, uh, the Earth hangs unsuspended in space, being equidistant from everything, there's nowhere for it to go. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, for Dim and Anaximedes comes along and says, everything's made of air, and everything that uh, Anaximander had accomplished. Um, but uh, this was a, a school, a, a, a group of philosophers who unconsciously said, you know, here is my view, go away and criticize it. Um, and, you know, in the, um, the, the, the socialization of newcomers to the university is part of that. Being able to take aspects of your identity, things that really matter to you, and hold them at arm's length so that they can be investigated, uh, criticized. Um, and if we see ourselves, um, if, if we adopt an identity as academics, where this is part of what we're about, then that, it still hurts. But it doesn't hurt as much, <laughs> um, so I think maybe um, there was something like the Golden Age. There's, there's a, um, um, a historical legacy of what a university could be that, 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 that might still resonate with us. Uh, but the question I want to ask is about um, uh, valuing uh, knowledge and valuing the pursuit of knowledge for their own sakes. And it's really hard even to articulate this idea. If you say something, like knowledge is important, well, it's important for what? Right? And then immediately it becomes instrumental again. Uh, and, and so how do we, uh, those of us who value understanding for its own sake, can value the processes of creating understandings and, and, and bringing understandings together uh, critically, um, how can we bring that to our students and even to our colleagues? No, it's a, a very good question, and I, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a, a straightforward, easy answer to it. Um, I'm just to, to backtrack a little bit, you know, what you were saying there about um, uh, students and, and the way they're being asked to test things about, about their own ideas and put them at a distance. I think that's such, such an important thing that we've lost. I mean, I don't know about the, whether I'd call it a golden age of, but, but I think that principle is, is so important. And I think it really kind of teaches me a lesson, even just hearing you say that, because I think in the past I've been quite critical of, of students for, um, I hate the expression snowflake, but you know, it's quite easy to kind of hold your hands up in horror at how overly sensitive these young people are. But I guess the more we, again, to come back to the kind of Harry and Meghan thing, the more we, we 
as older people tell young students that that knowledge is a question of perspective and identity, the more we're telling them not to have that distance, you know, we're telling them that knowledge is about themselves, that their understanding of the world is an intrinsic part of their identity. So we can't then laugh when they turn around and say, your words are wounding me, you know, that, that, that you're causing me psychic harm because we've told them, you know, this is a fundamental part of, of who you are. So then we've kind of sowed the seeds for this sense that if you attack what someone thinks, you're attacking them as a person. Um, sorry, but on the, the making the case for knowledge as an end in itself, you know, I, I think that's a difficult, it is a difficult thing to do, but I, I think it's, it's vitally important. I think we have to try and find uh, the way of words to, to be able to do that. And I guess the only thing I came up with was, you know, it's better to, to know than, than not to know. It's better to have knowledge than to be ignorant. And this idea that it's for, for humanity, not just for us, but for not just for us as individuals, but for humanity collectively to have this knowledge in the world for, for people to take in different directions and run with as they, they might, but, but, but that it's, it's a sign of human progress that we can know more today than we did yesterday. Yeah. Or like that, it's in these less. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Okay. So the thesis is that the shift of the university's mission away from truth uh, to um, these values uh, relegates uh, academic freedom to be essentially useless. Um, just as an observation at Laurier, the object of the university is uh, the pursuit of uh, scholarship uh, within an environment of free inquiry. Um, and then in about 2005, uh, they came up with the mission, vision, and values document. And I never heard the president justify a new policy Oh, of course, the mission, vision, and values was EDI, right? <laughs> I never hear the president defend an initiative on the basis that it uh, achieves our objective. It's always justified on the basis of the values. So I'm just seeing this in practice at Laurier uh, in spades. And then I'm interested as kind of a policy-oriented person to try and figure out, well, what's going to happen next if the thesis is correct? Uh, that academic freedom is essentially useless in this environment. So do you expect to start to see collective agreements water down academic freedom rights? Or will this happen um, uh, outside of the legal contract and more sort of uh, by neglect? Uh, you know, that an academic dissents, so a social media mob attacks the person, and then the university just sort of stands back and just watch them get destroyed. So I'm just curious what you think the implications are. Should, should SAFs expect to be starting to write letters about, you know, you can't water down collective agreement uh, rights, uh, or academic freedom rights to collective groups, or should we see more informal attacks on three? I mean, in, in the UK right now, the lecturers' union is uh, still quite strong in terms of membership. Um, but as I was showing yesterday, you know, it, it doesn't even... It, it's twisted its mission it, itself. It's twisted its own mission um, away from any. It wouldn't even pretend to be defending academic freedom anymore. Um, you know, I would say that promoting gender ideology is now the mission that has completely taken over our lecturers' trade union, that there's no sense of, of collective negotiation on principles of academic freedom. And, and my prediction, if you like, for what it's worth, is it, we will go much further down this line, the union. Uh, and, and again, you know, this is what makes today's situation, I think, quite unique because my, maybe I'm just getting old, but trade unions used to be hostile to managers, you know, and, and if you belong to the union, you were often on opposite sides of the picket line or you were politically on the other side of the fence to, to managers. Uh, certainly at the universities I'm most familiar with in the UK now, the local branch of the union is basically a subsection of the HR department. Um, they are as vested in the EDI policies uh, and in promoting the woke agenda as the managers. And, and what they do, in effect, is point out, you're not going far enough. You know, for the union officials to think that they're being critical is to say, you need to be, we need more gender neutral toilets. You know, um, we 
need more EDI training. We need compulsory critical race training for new members of staff. And that's how, how being a member of a union has come to be redefined. I mean, my sad prediction is that now we're in this situation, I kind of said, where people say, I support academic freedom, but I think very easily that gets dropped. You know, you've got this kind of rhetorical kind of nod that goes on going through the motions that goes on at the moment, but it, it's rubbish. You know, they then go on to tell you why they don't believe in it and why they think EDI values are the superior set of values. So I, I imagine, you know, if, we're, if nothing changes in 10 years, you know, you just drop that rhetoric and, and you see people far more explicitly campaigning against academic freedom, you know, it, wherever it might bubble up people, um, that, which is very sad. You know, I hope that prediction doesn't come true. I hope, I hope we win. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, my faith, if you like, my optimism, I'm not convinced that, I'm still not convinced, even despite everything that's going on in our schools and, and schools in the UK are absolutely at the forefront of the indoctrination projects in, in across all areas of school life. But I still think that when 18, 19 year olds turn up at university that day one of first year, I don't think that they're saying, you know, I'm here to start banning things. I'm here to start no platforming speakers. You know, I'm here to be indoctrinated in woke values. I still have this sense, and you know, I've got three of them myself, um, that, that these teenagers, people in their early 20s, you know, they arrive at university with some sense of wanting to learn something, of some sense of being genuinely interested in a subject, of some sense of being intellectually curious about the world. And I think what's tragic at the moment is that it's the university that's knocking that out of them. If your first taste of Freshers' Week is here's your mandatory sexual harassment training course, complete this by the end of the week, here's your mandatory diversity university training course, you're not going to start your first lecture until you've done that, um, then they're getting these messages. Don't bother being intellectually curious. Stop being interested in your subject. This is not what you're here for. You're here for something else. So I, I do kind of still have some faith in young people. I think they want more. And I think it, it's us, as in an older generation of, of adults and academics, who are squashing that in them. And I think if we stop you know, their natural curiosity, their desire to learn is still there somewhere and can still be nurtured, I hope. <laughs> yeah, Kurt. I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. You did? No. Oh, <laughs> oh but this, uh, Ken. Uh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed you tonight. Thanks so much for your talk today and last evening. Uh, it's frustrating to very many of us that when we uh, joined SAFs 25 or 30 years ago, we anticipated that this organization was going to change things, to turn things around. And I think I can speak for quite a few people in this room that 25 or 30 years ago, in the 1990s, when academics in Canada began to be canceled or platformed or dismissed, eliminated, uh, because somehow they breached political correctness, we kind of imagined that this was a fad that was going to blow over. And I remember quotes coming out like uh, the Shadow University by, of course, Silvergate, or John Fekka's Moral Panic, really good books, and you think, you know, this is going to make a difference. People are going to wake up and sort of mm -hmm. regain their senses. But that hasn't happened, and I believe probably most people in this room would agree that things are worse now than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That the constraints, you're walking on eggshells more now than, than then. And so, what I really like about your talk this afternoon is you said, you know, you need to understand why this wokeism as a phenomenon has arisen. In, and we need to have a good explanation for why it arose in order to devise a strategy for combating it and restoring more sanity to, to life in Western universities. And uh, you trace it to 
the postmodernism of the 1960s, which I think is accurate, and a lot of people have done that, and I believe that's right on. But then, what really interested me in your topics, then you said, well, why did the postmodern revolution happen in the 1960s? And you attributed it to the post-war era of what, if I understood correctly, sort of disenchantment with life as a result of uh, seeing the horrors of world. With the enlightenment values, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit, because I'm, I'm doubtful about that. I'm more inclined to think that the origin, what I know about 1950s, uh, regrettably, I even remember something. <laughs> that, that it was a time of intense consumerism and materialism, affluence relative to the previous couple of decades. And I was in, in Europe as in North America. And I wonder if the rise of postmodernism and the sheer goofiness that has overtaken universities in recent decades is not traceable in great part to the affluence of advanced capitalism. Mm. The people live in material abundance. They don't have to work very hard to make a living, you know, keep body and soul together. Not very many people in the advanced Western world are starving. And so it frees people to engage in all kinds of silly madness. <laughs> so just a response to that, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, it's a huge question, and, and this is, it would require a huge answer. I mean, I, I, just, just a very kind of brief thing I would say is that, obviously, I've, I've talked about academic freedom and free speech, and, and really pretty much within the context of academia uh, and, and what's going on within universities this afternoon. Um, but, but obviously, universities are part of society. You know, we, higher education doesn't exist in a separate kind of little vacuum away from what's going on in the rest of the world, whether that's in the economy or within society more broadly. And, and I think politically, what's happened over the past 80, 90, 100 years also has a very significant impact then upon what's going on in universities. And one thing I would say, you know, in, in not, not so much in put, put academic freedom to one side for a second, but in terms of, of kind of the, the victory, if you like, of woke within our institutions, I would say, in, and in terms of what I was just saying about trade unions, I don't think the um, academic union in the UK is alone in this adoption of woke. You know, you, you see, sadly, similar in, in many of the trade unions, all of the trade unions, pretty much, I would say. And, and I think to go back to what I was saying about Brexit and the um, shock and the distress of academics in response to that, really, uh, and the failure of Brexit, you know, just, just in case anybody's clear, you know, we, we've, we've formally left the EU, but Britain is, is still very, very, you know, there's been no gains as such. Um, but but I, I think politically what we've seen over the past 80 years is really the defeat of the working class as a political movement um, and as a solidarity, a sense of solidarity amongst working class people. And I think that has had all kinds of knock-on consequences uh, for society. You know, we don't really have at the moment in the UK a, a political opposition. You know, there's notionally a Labour Party and a Conservative Party. They're very much singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, there's a kind of technocracy. And, and this was why Brexit was seen as such an affront. And Boris Johnson was seen as such an affront and why he was ousted. You know, nobody voted for Rishi Sunak in, in the UK right now. We have a Prime Minister, absolutely no. No one, not even Conservative Party members, voted for. We have a, a Prime Minister who was essentially put into place um, in a, a revenge of the technocrats, if you like. It, it's their technocratic um, victory over the populist Brexit revolt. And I think that kind of putting back of the working class people in the box um, so that there isn't even a, a kind of a class identity. There's no sense of self-worth, of self-respect, which would, again, be a, a way that, that the kind of the autodidacts, the, the working class autodidacts, and taking pride in knowledge, taking pride in 
um, uh, bettering yourself. No, I don't mean by that moving class, but, but a sense of strong identity and, and knowledge and, and self-improvement being linked to that identity has been kind of squashed in so many ways. And I think woke is very much the product of this, where it becomes this very, like say, elite movement um, for a, a kind of political identity that adopts language of progressivism, but actually, as I was saying yesterday, rehabilitates kind of very old, horrible prejudices in a way that allows the elite group in society to rule to, to uh, under the guise of hashtag be kind, be nice, you know, the rainbow flag. They can dress themselves up in the rainbow flag, but what they're doing is very ruthlessly um, dividing, ruling and decimating the lives of working class people, I, I would say. <laughs> We'll have one more question. Maybe we'll have the last question, and then uh, we'll break for 10 minutes, come back uh, for the business meeting. Ava. Um, I want to pick up the theme of what, what triggered the, uh, the post-1960s uh, uh, workers and what happens before. Uh, then I'm sure there are quite a number of people in this room, such as me, who are old enough to remember that in the early 1960s, in Europe, because America, the United States already had um, a rather large number of university students. And they had a huge range of institutions of very low standards of height. And the European universities were all sort of uh, elitist uh, institutions. There was an enormous expansion in enrollment in universities from the 1960s onwards. And this triggered huge changes in well, the kinds of people who went to university, the kinds of people who appointed as, as academics, and so on. And it took quite a number of years for this thing to work out. And frankly, I think that had much more to do with, I think you're, you're right, it was the prosperity of those years uh, uh, more than the horrors of the war and so on. But I think the, what happened was that this expansion was so rapid and so large that a lot of people started entering universities who really would have been much better off getting uh, you know, good vocational education and so on. And we still live into this problem. I mean, it gets worse all the time because more and more and more people who, I, I don't mean to be pejorative about it, but who really are not really interested in learning in this appreciation of knowledge, the thing that you're talking, how can we inspire our young people to have that? I don't think you can inspire people to have it. It comes from inside. You, you have it. But, but the, the people want to have a profession, an occupation, and lead a good life. And so I think until we drastically reduce it all, but I mean drastically, I don't think this problem can be solved. All we have to change the institution to cater for a different kind of student. That they can benefit from it. They, they must benefit from its attendance. And I think a lot of the, the, the misbehavior of the students with respect to uh, closing down the meetings, canceling, screaming and shouting and not letting people speak, is that they are very uncomfortable in the university and have trouble fulfilling the, uh, the role that they would play if they could really benefit from a traditional university education. And I, I just leave it as a comment. <laughs> I mean, I, I wonder, just thinking about the kind of alpacas being brought into Oxford University um, again, you know, I wonder if, if some of what we're seeing students kicking off, if you like, is a response to the question, why are they there? You know, what, what are they doing? What, what they are asking themselves? What's been the point of the past three years? Why am I here? I think certainly expansion, you know, undeniable that this is a fact and, and expansion with working class people being permitted to go to university University uh, for the first time. Um, one of my favourite books, some people might have come across it, Malcolm Bradbury, The History Man. 
absolutely brilliant. I'm a fictional account of kind of working class people storming academia, elite academic institutions for the first time. But I actually think there's a lot of positives. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't want to row back um, on that, but that doesn't mean to say that you row back, uh, you know, not row back on the expansion. I think we need an, an, a university system I would like to see, which was based, you know, as we were talking earlier, purely based on merit. Uh, but I, I would also like to put into that, uh, my preference would be a university system which was on merit, but also intellectual curiosity, if it was a way of, of measuring that. And perhaps you could do it in conjunction with kind of high academic standards. How hard are you prepared to work? How interested are you in this subject? How much do you want to learn? And can you prove that by showing us how much you've learned already, you know, in order to enter the university as somebody ready to contribute to knowledge? I wouldn't want to go back to a time where it was just the preserve of a, a social elite. I'm, I know that's not what you're suggesting. Um, but, but, you know, I, I do think the expansion took place at a time when universities were also beginning to question what they were about. You know, you've got the, I don't think it was as, as simple as the, the, you know, the expansion happened and then the universities changed to meet with the, the bigger numbers. I do very much see these things as happening in conjunction with one another. And the fact in the UK, the expansion took place alongside building new institutions from scratch. You know, you had the, the plate glass universities suddenly you know were, were being built and then these new universities they very, very consciously adopted a different mission some of them replicated tried to replicate the elite institutions but there was a sense of we're, we're about something new we're, we're modern we're, we're going to have a different mission to the kind of the staid old academia that that's gone in the past and and I do think part of that and it's sociologists like Ulrich Beck um, Giddens who've pointed to this reaction against the, the horrors of the Holocaust in particular, how that was linked in the, the popular academic imagination at that time, uh, as, as not as a reaction against the Enlightenment, but as a product of Enlightenment values, that, that when you um, have a rationality, um, a, a desire to classify, to measure, uh, to, to engage in science in this way, you know, this is where it leads. It leads to the, the Holocaust, it leads to the nuclear bomb, you know, it leads to the, the, the barbarism of war. And, and it was very much a, a kind of, re the, these two things became seen together. So this rejection of the Enlightenment values, that, that this is where pro-intellectual progress takes us. So you have to reject that. You have to create a university which is about something new, a higher education system which consciously rejects that but but at that point without anything new being there it was just a rejection and a, a, a not obviously not everybody simultaneously so you had some of the old some of the new coming in and and a new search for purpose which largely became vocational largely just became about skills for employability let's train these kids up so they can get jobs but also opened the door for postmodernism to come in at that point Let's see, we've got Arthur and Lisa and Susan and Christina and Clyde, and we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>